Thank you very much. And uh, supposedly to inv inv the invitation to present a supposedly difficult uh, uh, lecture, but uh, I'll try to do my best. Uh, what I want to show you first is uh, just where we are today. This is the group today. And we focus a lot on molecules, but to some extent also on formulations, which uh, um, I think Nord Pop is about. Um, and I'm also director and founder of. Uh, I don't know how to move. You see this thing also? I'm going to get down here. Uh, of. Uh, uh, our platform for drug discovery and. Uh, uh, um, uh, in particular, um, Uppsala Drug Optimization Pharmaceutical Profiling Platform. And the reason for creating this platform was simply that I did not cover all fields that I wanted to have competence in. And uh, so now through this platform, apart from they doing a great job and they have, um, I think they have handled I think we have five spin-off companies and four compounds in, in the clinic uh, through PIs that use our platform and, and so on. Uh, we, um, uh, I got expertise in, for instance, drug metabolism, mass spectrometry, and so on, that I didn't, molecular biology and PK and PD modeling, things like I didn't master myself. But our students can then go and ask these people when I don't, uh, you know, suffice. Okay, so I'm trying to change, um, let's see, there seems to be a hang up now. Okay, so what we do is uh, uh, that we work with molecules in my research and have done uh, over the years. We build models, we predict things from those models and modeling and simulation, and we go and try to predict what happens in man. And we work with small molecules. We work with a lot with uh, uh, microcycles and, and the peptides that require formulation then. More recently, mainly as a platform, one of those successful uh, projects that they uh, handled was an antibody. And then uh, we are into something called oligonova today, which is an antisense oligonucleotide um, enterprise. And I will show you examples initially from ongoing projects that have or have not been published yet. And then I will go through my career and give some reflections as a back background to that. Uh, but just to give you the impression, as you know, uh, you need completely different skills to handle an antibody as compared to, to this little molecule over here. Okay, so what we do and have done over the years is to work, of course, with absorption models. Yeah. And that's why, what you know about me, I guess. Uh, and uh, then... Um, when I found out wanted to study active transport processes and so on, I understood that they are not uh, fantastic in the gut, so to say, with regard to importance. We mainly deal with passive permeability. So we went into the liver and also created models in the liver. And here today we have a 384 well format uh, for liver, 3D liver spheroid cultures. And, um, since, since, uh, since about a decade, we have also started to look at intracellular pharmacokinetics and so on. And in that field, uh, there are a lot of sinks in, inside cells that limits the access to the, the target, whether it's an enzyme or a transporter or a receptor. So current activities here deal with uh, these antisense oligonucleotides. Current activities here deals, and I will not cover that, deals with 3D organoid cultures of human intestinal cells um, from, uh, you know, stem cells derived, stem cells derived from trips. But I will not cover that today. So 
if we look at what we have been doing, and this is kind of a bragging slide where I put up some of, of the high high profile publications, and I will talk a little about what we have done in a big EU project called uh, Transient a couple of years ago. And that is now, um, we just submitted it again after half a year of revision. So this is a fairly high impact journal. And to the PhD student, I can say then that if uh, you get very good reviews in these journals, three very positive reviewers and one uh, rather neutral, and that's of course enough uh, to either be rejected or to be, uh, you know, have, have to fulfill extensive revision, uh, which, we, which we did during half the year here. So that's maybe not for a thesis always. Um, and then um, we have worked here also a lot with um, proteome profiling for of ADMA proteins for, for transporters and enzymes. And I'll show you how we applied that in modeling in 2021 in the paper. And then uh, here, uh, uh, we, I, I will show you some data, unpublished data then on antisense oligonucleotides, how we're trying to address that problem. Um, through this PI collaboration, we got several uh, high profile publications. The first one is here is such a publication. This is our own paper in the second one. And the third one is now the platform working without my, you know, I'm, I'm not the youngest guy in the room here. And so uh, they are now doing an excellent work on their own. And here is a just published paper from a, a big IMI project collaboration where we develop new antibiotics. So first uh, about this uh, paper then that was uh, uh, mainly performed by Patrick Lundqvist then. And uh, it was a part of this Transint project. And the idea was then to investigate uh, the intestinal, human intestinal permeability and toxicity, which I will not cover because I can say briefly none was toxic, uh, of insulin containing nanoparticles that pass the criteria set up by the Transin Consortium. As, I, as you know, nanoscience has been popular for many, many years, but often it's beautiful art, you know, rather than uh, practically applicable science. Um, and things that are uh, uh, not considered include, for instance, loading capacity. So if you have very low loading capacity of your nanoparticle system, maybe it's not so useful uh, when you try to scale it to humans and so on. But here in this project, uh, all these things were covered and there were hundreds of nanoparticles from all over Europe from different groups that were filtered down here. And in the end, we had four arginine-enriched particles that were selected for uh, ex vivo studies in, in human intestinal uh, tissues. And in by David Braden, in, who is also part of this paper in uh, rat studies in situ. And this is then what we did. We did human jejunum ex vivo in acid chambers. We did rat jejunal um, installation in, in Dublin. And uh, you can see that these three finalists, they were a pronounced binding to mucus. They didn't pass the mucus layer. They did not reach the epithelium and they had low or no permeability. But one particle uh, uh, here that had some uh, lipid anchoring of these uh, uh, arginine peptides in combination with PEG uh, uh, showed no mucus binding. I should say PEG was part also here or other hydrophilic, uh, hydrophilic surfaces. Um, they showed a significant uptake in the epithelium and they had a low permeability. So, um, so this is what it looked like then. So if you look here, we can see the particles in the vicinity in the confocal to the uh, actin belt here and to uh, the uh, lectins in, in, the, in the brush border membrane. 
and you can see some diffuse staining pattern below, but we really needed high resolution microscopy here that allowed us to count individual particles. And when we did that, we could see that the absorbed dose actually was pretty high. Um, so uh, while no systemic insulin could be delivered with this system, we by serendipity, we can say, found something else, namely um, a, a large local uptake for, uh, I would say, for local release of drugs and compounds. So that's what the inventors of these particles, which is Amalia Alonso in um, Santiago de Compostela, are exploring now. So with that, I take the second example, and that's uh, done by Christine Wegers uh, during her thesis work. And uh, th this was also part of a big collaboration um, called the Cocktail Study, uh, where, which was led by a Norwegian obesity center uh, in, uh, I forget the name of the, uh, the location but um, uh, it's Jöran Jelmset who leads that, uh, uh, that work. And lots of things were done, and this was financed by AstraZeneca, and Christine was financed by the Swedish Research Council. But um, in those studies, we used uh, generated parameters for transport of this statin, Rosela statin, in vitro, we determined uh, the protein expression in the patients and we uh, modeled them the pharmacokinetics of these compounds. So this is how it was done. We had cells and tissues. We did in vitro pharmacokinetics and proteomics and of course in vivo pharmacokinetics done by our, done by our collaborators. Then we modeled our in vitro data and compared them with the in vivo outcome. And uh, uh, this is an obesity study, but in this paper, we actually in the end merged these two uh, 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 groups because there were no sense of difference more than with regard to body mass index. And um, it could be interesting also for the PhD students that this paper was rejected, but Christine is very um, persistent, so she hanged in there. And, and um, I had to write, you know, letter to argue uh, uh, it was a, that it was not okay to reject this uh, paper. It was the first of its kind and so on. And it, eventually it was published. So here we see the individual data uh, in pharmacokinetics in those 54 patients. And we can see uh, uh, that there were large inter-individual differences. Here are data for the uh, Rosva statin is taken up in the liver by four transporters, which is in vitro kinetics. We had expression systems for these. So we had the KM values and so on for the modeling. Uh, and we did the proteomic analysis, and we can see that the dominating uptake protein here was um, 0.81. But all this uh, contributed, perhaps not oitp 2 b one that much, a few, a few percent only. And then uh, we constructed the model, and for um, uh, Rosvastatin is extensively secreted into bile, but there we had studies already, so we used those values or it had been, become too much. And um, then we compared the predicted results from this model then in, uh, with those observed in patient. And for being a PDPK model that is built on parameter generation, the outcome was good. If it had been a PKPD model or so, or a mechanistic, completely mechanistic model, the, the variation would have been less. But we actually corrected this also later due to genetic variation of the, in, in the patients. Some patients had that were underpredicted actually had a variant that uh, of OATP1B1 that had uh, a reduced function, and then we could shift that overall. Okay, 
So now I've given you two examples of big uh, uh, of, of uh, something we did in the intestine and something we did in the liver. And now I will say something about in subcellular drug distribution. And what I want to say there and about this project and about the other projects is that they are examples of scientific evolution of myself, since they are all big collaborative projects. Uh, so um, a drawback or maybe sometimes an advantage with my scientific career has been that I switch, uh, switch uh, I shouldn't say switch focus, but do new things all the time. And one new thing that is very complicated actually, that is to have these big collaborations where we together can produce something fairly strong. And this is just um, now, uh, uh, what I show you now is not at all complete uh, results. I just show you uh, what we are doing on the way. And if we look here, uh, there are many factors that influence then the intracellular concentra free concentration that is available for interaction with the target or the, uh, the receptor. And we call that intracellular bioavailability. Some would, because that's understandable for drug discovery scientists. In drug development, it's called KPU, and the big inspiration source was, of course, uh, Margareta Udenes, um, Hamann Udenes, our colleague, just retired colleague, who, um, who uh, did this in tissue slices and so on. But we scaled it down to, to cells. And we used this in many applications here successfully to improve modern inferences of drug drug interactions or understand the gap between phenotypic uh, and uh, phen to phenotypic uh, pharmacological response. But here we ask the question then, and this was Andrea Treyer who started this project together with AstraZeneca then, and now it's part of this big oligonova uh, uh, attempt uh, that is uh, located in Göteborg under the leadership actually of Permats. Um, so, uh, so the question is, can this intracellular bioavailability also predict uh, intracellular free concentration and activity of antisense oligonucleotides? And what we used initially in this, uh, in Andrea's thesis, that was actually published in 2019, um, was that we had Psi-3 labeled, fluorescently labeled antisense oligonucleotides, and then we had a receptor targeting uh, moiety here, a peptide that targeted GLP-1 um, uh, receptor, which is the same target as hemagglutin has, for instance. So, you know, everyone is working on the same stuff in, in different ways. And then we also added the cell penetrating peptide to these uh, uh, Conjugates actually also conjugated, but also in free form. And the outcome was modest, and that's why we went on. But it was possible to see differences in intracellular bioavailability then. Um, so we can see here that uh, uh, we had wild type cells and we had cells overexpressing uh, the targeting moiety. And we could see when we added that, we got a higher uptake, higher intracellular bioavailability. And when we added the cell penetrating or endosomal release peptide by the, uh, synthesized by, um, by Deho Apey uh, at Ohio State University initially, but uh, Shi, by Yang Shin bearing this collaborative project, we could get a slightly higher in improvement. And we could see that also in staining the Psi 3. But we are not happy with this. And, Probably the high uh, controls here is due to long incubation times and so on, where we also get uptake of free uh, antisense. So what we have been doing recently is to start working with proximal ligation assay, um, which is an assay where you have an antibody against, for instance, an organelle-specific marker and against the Psi 3 ASO and then you look at co-localization. And this is a technique that has been developed by Ulf Landegren in Uppsala that is now 
uh, used in in, in uh, um, uh, commercially by all big pharma uh, uh, through his his uh, company he founded here. So uh, it's very sensitive, and the idea is then that we over time should be able to see how this marker or location shift then in the cells. So with that, uh, so the summary here is that uh, we are doing things, but it's uh, the, these projects are rather slow. It's not quick fixes for a thesis, so to say, but it's it's rather demanding projects that I enjoy very much now towards the end of my career. But uh, what about my scientific evolution then? And I spend the, the last minutes or the last uh, third of my talk on that. And actually my thesis was not in ADME, but it was in drug delivery and targeting. So what I did was to, I got the task to develop starch microspheres, biodegradable, actually biodegradable microspheres, but I showed starch then that I cross-linked in emulsion polymer, by emulsion polymerization. Um, and uh, in that way, they also entrapped proteins that maintained their um, kinetic properties. And how could they do that? They did that because these were macroporous uh, particles. So uh, the proteins were just entrapped uh, maybe in one place and the rest was sticking out or something like that. Now, the goal with this was to do uh, to work with uh, a lysosomal storage disease named Gaucher's disease, which is a storage disease for lipids. And the idea was to administer beta glucose cerebrosidase as uh, in these particles. And this disease is unique in that it's not in hepatocytes, it's in copper cells that engulf, you know, take up particles. So what you see as a disturbance when you want to do drug targeting elsewhere was the target here. So that was easy. Uh, now, um, what, what happened then was that I was worried in my first paper, I was worried about immunology uh, because uh, in those days, uh, the first part of the 80s or 1980s, then uh, human proteins were rare. Human serum albumin, of course, existed as a plasma expander in human immunoglobulin, but no, essentially no other pro human proteins were available as, as bulk. And uh, what happened then was that uh, People did, uh, there came a paper before I started my thesis in 77 by Abraham Abukowski, Abushowski in the uh, Journal of Biological Chemistry, which was a leading journal at the time. And he showed that if one pegulates proteins, they lose immunogenicity, right? So I decided to pegulate my modal proteins and put them into these spheres. And then I injected them intravenously into mice. And to my big surprise, uh, the particles got a very extended half-life when I did that, which I thought was not very good, you know, because that meant that they would not reach the Kupfer cells quickly. So, uh, of course, what I did without knowing it at the time was a sterically stabilized particle. And um, these were, when, I, when you look back, it was us and it was a group in the UK that worked with that, me without knowing, and uh, Bob Davis and Lisbeth Illum's group in, in Nottingham with a, with a goal of extending half-lives. Uh, so uh, I'm telling you this because it's a serendipity finding. My mind was not prepared or my supervisor's mind was not prepared to switch course, you know, and exploit this. Rather, we continued with targeting of copper cells, which was fun because that's how I learned to culture cells and so on. Anyway, uh, we exploited these particles. They were worked as adjuvants also. And after I left this project, they were actually tested for some tropical disease in clinical studies in India and so on. So some different things, but 
uh, and we targeted. Um, I never purified. To those who think their thesis is over overwhelming, we actually got a lot of placenta tissue where this enzyme was present from Institute Mario in Paris. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we got these packets with tissues and um, we stored them in the freeze, but I never had time to purify any any glucocerebrosidase, so I just used model proteins. Okay, there was some uh, good impact of that thesis anyway, because I was offered a postdoc um, in the UK uh, at uh, Pharma, and they wanted me, because I could do this, had good uh, particle knowledge. But um, uh, then I negotiated. I wanted to learn something new. And they used something called Keiko tube cells for epithelial cell biology. And uh, when they used those cells, they um, actually uh, did not use them for drugs. They used them to look at how uh, the tissue was organized and so on, because I wasn't actually, I didn't mention that, I wasn't in big pharma itself. I was at an institute called Advanced Drug Delivery Research. And the founder of that institute, Eric Tomlinson, he actually also founded the journal Advanced Drug Delivery Research. Um, and he named it after his institute. So the, that journal that all of you know, I guess, um, was founded by him at the same time um, to, to promote actually the institute that only lasted for five years. And then they got a new CEO at what is at Siba, as, as it was at the time, Siba Geigi, but now Novartis, and they closed it. So it was a short, uh, short period with, with uh, about, we were about 30 PhDs uh, of, of total of 50 people working together on drug delivery. It was fantastic. And some of the people there had amazing careers, like Martin Mackay, who actually published a nice paper on vitamin B12 or cobalamin uptake by Keiko Tucens. Martin later became research director of Pfizer and for a short period also AstraZeneca. So, you know, by going abroad to the right place, you meet also important uh, people or can meet important people. Mm -hmm. The only thing we did after that was go out. He, he, he liked soccer and he liked uh, whiskey. <laughs> so those were the things we shared uh, later on, you know, but um, not, uh, not a lot of science. Anyway, uh, I asked them the question when I left my postdoc if I could use them to study drug permeability because these cells were cultured on filters in that, uh, at that location. And no one was interested, so they said yes. And that's how Keiko um, cells were introduced in our fields. And I got this correlation with permeability and absorption. And then that gave other things, other ideas, absorption barriers, absorption enhancers. We did the first mechanistic studies on sodium cap rate, you know, which is the predecessor of SNAC and is also used in uh, some of the clinical um, clinical um, uh, clinically approved drugs for pepti peptides to enhance peptide uptake and so on. We developed other models with a mucus barrier, not so good, but still uh, with an M cell model, a model that uh, had tight junctions that were more small intestinal like leaky and so on. And we looked at permeability mechanisms. So we found something. We were always few people here, uh, maybe two, three, and later maybe five, six people. So which gave me more time to think, you know? So um, that, was, um, that was a good thing we had. And then Molecular mechanics came along among medicinal chemists. So then I decided to look at uh, computational predictions. And then in analytical chemistry, something called the polar surface area was used for uh, predicting column interactions um, instead of metaphysicity and so on. So I 
talked to Christina Lutman, who actually was in Tromsø for a while. I think uh, Göril know her well, and and uh, she um, uh, she it took about two years for me <laughs> to convince her that we should do something with this in in uh, in. Uh, permeability prediction. And then uh, uh, we started to work on this and had some talented students on this. And, and uh, we started to generate parameters for molecular surfaces. And uh, it turned out to be um, a very good predictor of permeability and a better predictor of something that was popular than the permeability of peptide mimetics, because peptide mimetics were a little larger and they were not well predicted by, so well predicted by hydrogen bonding and hydrogen acceptors and so on. So we published the first paper here in 1996. And then um, in 1997, the rule of five came along. So during these years, I learned to know uh, Chislipinski, and we spoke at the same conferences and so on. So, so that was uh, uh, great fun. And of course, uh, when Chris developed the rule of five, he had um, uh, actually uh, psychologists uh, on the team because he needed some magics of numbers to convince medicinal chemists that this was a useful instrument. So now today, you know, things evolve. And while this was very useful, and we still use rule of five or similar, um, you know, um, rule sets today, uh, some people say, you know, that this delayed the development of the field for a long time because you, people stayed within this space and did not explore new spaces and so on. Anyway, another comment worthwhile mentioning was that a lot of people who had, after a lot of resistance against KQ2 cells, uh, actually my first grant application on KQ2 cells were uh, rejected with the words that this cannot be true, you know, it cannot be this good. So. But then uh, people learned to cultivate these cells after some failures and it started to spread in the industry and so on. And then when this came along with polar surface area and molecular surface and so on, then you, the conservatism among scientists was exposed in terms of, you know, why do you present this? Don't you want people to use KQ2 cells anymore? <laughs> so please be flexible, have flexible minds. and. Um, uh, don't don't worry to take away your uh, you know your babies do do new things. So uh, okay, what happened next then? Well, uh, we started to do predictions with and experiments, of course, as I showed you in this liver example, in vitro studies with um, transporters, uh, and we we expanded this molecular surface stuff into a difficult area. Uh, to predict solubility, and the first uh, the first thesis there was was a very good thesis presented by Christian Bergström, who, who leads uh, the uh, NOMPOP, I think, uh, maybe not, but she's <laughs> no, maybe not, but she's in the leadership or so. Uh, so um, uh, uh, Kiki, uh, this is Kiki's thesis, and there was one more thesis here, and here is. Permatson thesis and uh, some, some more theses. But Permatson uh, is now, uh, since two years, I think, professor in, at Salgens Academy in Göteborg in pharmacokinetics. And he also leads the hub, the Oligonova hub, that is part actually of this drug discovery platform. So, uh, uh, you know, another thing is to identify good uh, good students when uh, things go smoothly. So what I didn't tell you is that I made these excursions also. Uh, so I could merge drug delivery with the knowledge about uh, uh, the knowledge in cell biology I learned during these studies on, on 
drug permeation and transport and drug fate. And uh, now we are back here to oligo delivery, but we also did, uh, I also did the sabbatical uh, ex exactly after when everyone was demanding these things. I, I went to the US with my family and to a gene therapy company. I was invited actually, but still, this was the gene therapy company that had the patent for lipofectamine, which is this transfection agent. It was located in Texas. And we had a great time there uh, my, uh, for, for, for some time. And this is, uh, uh, and got new knowledge that I resulted in a couple of theses but also that I have uh, can use now when we enter the oligo field. So you never know, you know, when when there's a lot of interesting things and uh, and look up for new things. So if I should summarize what I what I've been talking about is that actually mainly what I have done is to look at other fields and import things into our field, right? Uh, that's a big factor in to see, oh, here is an idea. This looks interesting. I wonder how this works in, in my context. And I think that's, that's something that is very, very nice uh, uh, to do. Another thing, finally, uh, that I can mention is I didn't bring, uh, sometimes when I, sometimes I give, haven't given that many, <laughs> this talk that many times, but I've also had an armchair uh, with a lamp. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, why do I show that? Well, that was the first advice I got as a PhD student when I, you know, asked the famous department head of our department of biochemistry if I should, you know, go for what, what it takes to do a PhD. And uh, Henry Danielsson, who, um, who also was our dean here at the Faculty of Pharmacy, uh, he was uh, came from the famous group that this uh, Nobel laureates that discovered prostaglandins and leukotrienes at Karolinska Institute, and uh, they were two who got the Nobel Prize. But the third person was actually Henry, then. and um, so he was on on that full structure for for uh, prostaglandins. Um, but why didn't he get the Nobel Prize? Well, um, Sune Bergström, who was the nestor in that group, he gave the leukotrien path to Bengt Samuelsson, who got the Nobel Prize, and Henry got bilacids, which was also very hot at the time, but didn't lead to the same, you know, interesting um, impact at the time as uh, the leukotrienes. So that was the background. So we ended up at the Faculty of Pharmacy in Uppsala. But what he said to me is that when you come home after a day at, in the lab, and if you sit down in this armchair, and if you still, if you still think about your research, you know, think it's so fun. So you, so you want to think maybe you want to pick up that paper we had. You know, we didn't read on the screen in those days. You, you, you <laughs> made all these copies. Uh, in the library and brought with you and um, and sit down and read an article or something like that then you are the right if you if you go home of course this is not more than thing to say I am aware of that but that's what he told me and I was sufficiently interested uh, to to do that without you know without getting angst for not doing other things and so on so that, uh, so that was something. Uh, of course, you have to be interested interested in your research uh, to uh, to get these ideas and so on, and you have to these thoughts have to come every now and then, and then one realizes it's as fun as playing a computer game or something else. So, with that, um, thank you very much for listening.